Uh, hello and welcome to this latest community conversation with Minds at Work. One of the aims of this community is to connect people with ideas and ways of working that can help to establish more mentally healthy workplaces. But to truly have a mentally healthy workplace, you must both em you must embrace both mental health and well-being and foster a sense of belonging for all employees, regardless of gender, race, ability, sexuality, or indeed family status. And that's why I'm so excited to welcome today's guest to our community. Have you ever asked a female peer if she has children as a way of making small talk? It might seem like an everyday inoffensive topic, but can actually be quite triggering to women who are childless not by choice or childless by circumstance. It can be a taboo subject still with the assumption that a childless woman must have made the conscious choice to not start a family. Yet levels of childlessness for those over 30 have been steadily rising as childbearing is reared. And of women aged 45 years in 2020, 18% were childless. Thankfully, there is a growing community of women who are sharing their stories to help those who, who might feel left out or left behind in this sort of circumstance. And today's guest is one of those women. And I'm very thankful to her because I'm also one of those women. So thank you very much, Yvonne John. Uh, you are, of course, an ambassador for World Childless Week and a workshop facilitator with Gateway Women. You're also the author of the book, Dreaming of the Life Unlived, Intimate Stories and Portraits of Women Without Children. And I'm delighted you've agreed to speak with us today. Welcome, Yvonne. Thank you so much for having me. And I love, 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 love your introduction. It's so beautiful. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so let's let's start with the absolute basics here, you re do refer to yourself as childless, not by choice. So can you tell us a little bit about your story and what that means to you? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's kind of been refined recently. So I'll be childless, not by choice, childless by circumstance, childless by ambivalence and childless by choice. Mm -hmm. And that all comes out in my story. So mm -hmm. I, at 39, got married. No, sorry. I'm, I met my husband at 39, got married at 40. I might have even got that wrong. <laughs> I got married at 39 and I decided to try and have children at 40. There we mm -hmm. go. And pre that, I mean, I didn't have the best date in life. And so I, I did meet my then husband quite late. So I met him when I was about 38. And at the time we had a conversation around, are we going to have children? And mm -hmm. At that time, it was, and it was quite a, like, you know, blasé conversation. Mm -hmm. I think both of us, because of our age, felt like it probably wouldn't happen anyway. Mm -hmm. And because of our age, felt like, you know, we've kind of got that boat, boat sailed. So mm -hmm. wasn't really that bothered about it. So mm -hmm. at 40, um, I made the choice of wanting to try. And pretty much because I didn't want to hit menopause, without having to have tried. I kind of felt like if I hit menopause and I hadn't, you know, had not done nothing about it over the years, I, it really would have sucked. Mm -hmm. So, and I never felt that I would be sad about it. I just felt like as long as I had tried, it would have been okay. Mm -hmm. So we embarked on this journey of trying to conceive for, naturally for three years, nothing happened, mm -hmm. which was a surprise because apparently you just have to look at a guy and, <laughs> want to have sex with him and you can get pregnant so I don't uh, know what's going absolutely. On. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a year of fertility investigation and at 43 um going on 44 I sat in front of a fertility consultant to be told I had unexplained infertility mm -hmm. and I know there's a world of women out there who've heard these the this these two words and it you know it basically means we don't know why you can't get pregnant everything was fine apparently with me, with my ex-husband. So they shouldn't have been a reason why. Mm. We had the pat on the back, you know, I had the pat on the back, but just keep trying. Mm. And, but for me, I knew in that moment, I just knew I was not gonna be a mum. Mm. And the grief hit me like, you know, it was like a tsunami of grief that just hit me all of a sudden, which was a surprise because up until that point, mm. I really wasn't that bothered. You know, and I'd gone through my 20s, 30s, kind of, yeah, maybe, no, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, maybe, no, I'm not going to do it. And it was, again, it felt like a really easy thing to say, but I, I didn't have much thought around it. It just, it was literally about, you know, was I in a relationship that I wanted to, 
have a baby with? No. Did I meet a guy who had nice hair and could have produced really nice babies? Yes. And it was all, of, it was literally, I was bouncing from that. But what I realized when that grief hit me and, and I subsequently did my grief work, I realized it was about having a baby under the right circumstances. Mm. So for me, being married, um, having a good job, because that's what you're supposed to have as well. And mm. actually went to university, had a good job, got my career, got a husband, had a good home, <laughs> should have had baby. And mm. it just didn't happen. And it made no sense. Um, and at the time, not realizing why I was that sad about it mm. the grief made no sense either and I didn't recognize it as grief because I just didn't know I could be grieving so for me the sadness was instant I couldn't be around my friends with their young families couldn't be on a train watching young families get on and meeting up for a day out couldn't hear the words I'm pregnant wanting to just run and hide and just cry at every every instant there was a pregnancy or a baby or something around you know mm. all of that and and yeah for me it just it was hard it was hard and it was hard because I didn't have the language to explain what I was going through I didn't understand what I was going through and I felt a lot of shame mm. so in my 20s and this is where the childless by choice part of it comes into it in the in my 20s I chose not to continue with two pregnancies I had at the time I wasn't in a relationship at either of those times so for me it wasn't the right circumstances it wasn't the right person it just it just wasn't and I wasn't ready mm. I really wasn't ready I you know looking back I realized I wanted much more for my children and I bought into the dream as mm. well of how it should be Mm. A wonderful word should and I yeah so you know in at that time it just wasn't right I wanted more for my children I wanted more for me and I wanted to be with someone who loved me and wanted that with me not just this blase oh you know do what you want kind mm. of situation mm. so feeling like you know being in that place where I knew it wasn't going to happen feeling so sad feeling this wave of shame as well because it had to be my fault yeah and and then also it became very silencing because how, why would anyone think I deserved to be a mum when they knew what I had done and that's what I was saying to myself so mm -hmm. when I was faced with all those really negative uh, words in my head feeling like you know I couldn't forgive myself I guess so no one else would forgive me um, I couldn't look at myself and think, you know, I did the right thing because no one else would do it. And it just kept, it kind of spiraled out of control to the point where I just shut down mm. and I felt like I couldn't function anymore. Um, and I was fortunate that I had a friend who was going through it. So she instantly knew I was grieving. And I remember her saying to me, it's grief. And I said to her, how can I be grieving when I haven't lost anything? Mm. And besides that, I didn't deserve it. Mm. so it wasn't possible mm. and she knowing Jodie Day who's the founder of Gateway Women says you know you've got to meet Jodie she's doing this work in the in the community mm. and I met Jodie in December 2014 when I did the, my first workshop with Gateway mm. Women and at the time it was a workshop called Living Without Children and I could not believe that I could sit in a room of 14 other women mm grieving the loss of motherhood and be accepted yeah. for my loss too. And mm. it just opened up this possibility that I could heal from this, but also I knew I had to understand it. So I did the Plan B Mentorship Programme in 2015, because at mm. that point I realised, you know, oh my God, this is real. And I really need to understand why I was grieving to the depths that I was grieving in. Mm. And, and we'll talk about Gateway Women in a sec, it sounds like an absolutely fabulous uh, organisation. And you, of course, have gone on to become a coach and a mentor with them as well. Yeah. But you talked there a lot about grief. You also talked about that wonderful word, should. You talked a lot about shame as well. So how did all of this journey impact your mental health? It, I just felt like I didn't deserve to be mm. anywhere, you know, I, it felt in a way it felt like a punishment and I deserved it yeah you know because I I didn't have the right 
to want to be a mum anymore because I'd given up that opportunity. And, you know, I didn't know if I would have recognised it as depression at the time, but it felt, you know, I was incredibly sad. So mm. it would be feasible to say, you know, I was in a depressive state. Mm. I was still functioning, but yeah. I certainly wouldn't talk about it. Absolutely would not talk about it. I wouldn't even talk about it with my then husband, um, which caused it immense strain on our relationship because you know I'm shutting down and he didn't know why mm. it was silencing and also then I started to really hate other women for being pregnant yeah. you know how can you be pregnant and I can't why do you deserve it and I don't you know I yeah and, and the judgment <laughs> that comes in yeah. and the language that's in your head and and these are normal you know I have no judgment over this it's something you know I had the judgment on myself because I felt mm. there was a sense of shame for even thinking like that mm. but it is normal stuff and this is what grief does it, it will bring all these things up and I think without that space to process it mm. it it just really it really does shut us down it makes us feel less than mm. and we feel horrible evil wicked all sorts of you know we take on all those negative mm. words and connotations and that language that in a way you know it's a wonder we ever leave our, our homes because of how crap we feel yeah <laughs> you know? and yeah I just I just know you know, I just remember just crying all the time and and just n not being able to talk to anyone. I just couldn't mm. utter the words. I could not tell anyone what I was going through. So I just shut down in my own head. And mm. if I could have stayed in my bed and the diva, I would have done. Yeah. And as you say, that has a knock on effect to other areas of your life as well your relationship did, did it impact your work as well how you were showing up at work or was that an escape I think it was an escape however I was <laughs> <laughs> managing women who were getting pregnant yes so it became you know in hearing like you get the pregnant princesses and that you know the, it's like I don't it's hard because you think look I don't begrudge anyone anything but when you're in this camp especially when you're early on in your grief it's mm. really hard to sit with somebody hearing them complain about their back aches or moan mm. about how morning sickness or whatever it is even hearing my friends you know having difficult days with their children and they're you know mm. they're on the phone having the moan and you're like what <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and and I you know I'll be sitting there angrily in silence mm. and I remember even a time when my friend um was saying she found it difficult to conceive her second child I really did want to throw something at her because <laughs> <laughs> what I gotta make a scene one <laughs> and you're yeah. so and 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 it's hard with your family and friends but then when you're going to the workplace when they're not your family and friends yeah. and they you know you might I I I suppose in a way contained it really well so I had the anger internally and mm. just wouldn't be around them or just be around them for a very little time do the mm. pretend smile and leave as soon as I could at work mm. you don't get to do that no <laughs> well you could go on sick but you know it's really mm. harder to do it and and also you're a, around a bunch of people who are not going to be as forgiving as your family and friends may be might be mm. so you know I did have moments where I found it very very difficult to hear someone who felt that they couldn't lift a finger because they were pregnant and mm. you know and I get that they were protecting themselves and their unborn child because that is a natural instinct mm. it just became very hard to be on the other side of that when you wished you could be the one yeah. saying actually no I don't feel like I can work today because I'm pregnant <laughs> yeah and then, of course, you get to the other side where everybody brings the baby in to meet everybody oh, at then. work. <laughs> <laughs> and all the joy in between. Yes. <laughs> and it, it's, I mean, even now, you know, I still, I still find it hard. I, mm. I manage it a lot differently. Mm. However, it's still hard. I, I find, I find it, I have this I'm in a way curious morbid interest in how <laughs> pregnant women show up in the workplace now mm. um, coupled with how much it triggers my grief 
Mm. And you know, the way that as soon as someone finds sounds like they're pregnant, all of a sudden they are very different. They are communicating differently with people. Mm. They are, you know, showing up in in all sorts of ways differently and mm. being upset that other people haven't noticed they're pregnant and making the announcements to everybody because no one's coming up to them and saying, hey, pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so they, oh, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's so much and then you know so it's this journey in between because it mm. it doesn't kind of start when they said they're pregnant and then end and then start again when they've had the baby it's all the way through there's parts of it that you see and try and avoid you know mm. you've got the whatever you know the announcements publicly and everyone congratulating them publicly and then you've got the collections and the cards and the mm. so the collective excitement of this person who's going to have a baby and then mm. they have a baby and they announce it and so, or some you know somebody comes in and announces it to everyone and you're like yeah. <gasps> and then you get the uh you know share all pictures and the reply all remarks yeah. leave me out of it <laughs> <laughs> it's like being on baby watch for nine months right and then the you know <laughs> and yeah and I found you know the interesting thing with baby watch <laughs> is I found my anxieties around it changing as they were changing. Mm -hmm. I found it as hard as it was, because I, I like used to have to stop myself from staring at the bump because I became very obsessed mm. with this bump, but also the anxiety of knowing that that's not going to be a bump past a certain mm. date. Mm. And I found it very hard to transition from bump becoming baby and, and then what it meant. Cause I think when it's, you know, when you're growing, when they're growing, I should say mm. up until they give birth, there is that excitement, but it's a different level. Cause when it, when the baby comes, that's, that's just very different. And there's yeah. this outpouring of love and gushing and excitement and all sorts of other stuff that that bit I can't do I find I I cannot do that when it happens I just like no I have to get out and that they haven't even brought baby in as yet <laughs> yeah yeah um so I mean that as you say that's a whole journey there's all sorts of different emotions mixed up in that and you mentioned gateway women earlier so um could you tell me a little bit about gateway women and the work that you personally do with other women that are in these circumstances yeah, so Gateway Women, who's recently changed the name to Lighthouse Women, mm -hmm. is a community that supports women who are childless by circumstance. Um, it's online, it's international reach, and it's there for women to be able to reach out and talk to each other. You've got women of all at all stages of their grief, mm. and it's that platform where we can get instant support. Mm. No, you know, no matter what it is somebody will get it somebody will give you those words of encouragement those words of comfort when outside of that all we get is someone trying to fix us or dismiss us or silence us and, and you know I know it's not intentional they mean well mm. but that's what it does so having that community where you can be you mm. you can release you can be free to say what you want and experience all that comes with whatever you know comes with being in this world without children is such a cathartic healing experience and then we have the workshops so we've got the reignite weekends where and I'm a trained facilitator to um, facilitate the weekends and we help to support women work through the grief of childlessness mm -hmm. so it's a two-day workshop where women are able to come along it's um, you know you see them coming in on a Saturday and you see how heavy the grief is and we work through different exercises through the Saturday and we're looking at the five stages of grief. The Sunday we start to look at kind of the present and the future and start to get them towards dreaming again. And you can see all the blockages and the resistance and the difficulties that they're carrying, but you also see them starting to let go of them. Mm. To, to open up, to allow themselves to, to believe that it's possible to dream again because when you've tried when you've been in that space of trying for so long mm. it can be very hard to smile and laugh and feel like I do have life because it's almost like that hope is gone 
you know what yeah. what have I got to dream live for let alone dream again mm. so to kind of get them into that place where they can start to see that this is possible that there is another version of our lives that we are allowed to have that we can have for me it's part of my healing and it brings so much joy because you see that opening up it's like the flower that starts to open up you know you yeah. see the spark signs come in their lives you see women that don't want to talk from day one that don't stop talking <laughs> at day two because now they're allowed to yeah they've got that space where no one's gonna fix them mm. they're just being received with love and care and we yeah. are witnessing each other's stories and we are seeing each other for who we are and where we're at and we still love and accept them so they can love and accept themselves mm. you know I just it it's one been one of the most joyous parts of my journey mm. to be able to offer that space and hold that space for women to be able to step in that room and just breathe it sounds like a really beautiful experience actually yeah um and that that listening that witnessing that giving voice is one of the reasons why you wrote your book as well um it's a way of to unashamedly own your story of being childless as you say on your website and to give childless women of color a voice as well um so I'm wondering what drove this need for you and and what sort of opinions, judgments, challenges uh, women such as yourself might face in the wider world? So for me, and I remember the moment when I said I'm going to write this book, (laughs) (laughs) because I was on the Plan B uh, mentorship program, Mm. and I remember one, one you know, one of the days we we met every month um, on a Saturday, and I remember being there one day working through something, and I was listening to the women tell their stories, And it dawned on me because there was so much around basically not being able to talk to families and friends, the sadness, the hurt, the fixing that goes on. And and in some, you know, in a lot of respects, the anger that was behind it uh, or being, you know, generating within within us from that. And I just thought, you know what, no one's listening to us. And I really wanted to give us our voices back. I, I really for me, it was like I got my justice cape on and I thought, you know what? damn it, (laughs) the world's going to listen to us, I'm going to write a book about this. And there was so much excitement behind it. (laughs) And I I mean, for one, I didn't believe, I couldn't believe I was saying this. And then then it was like, I don't even know how I'm going to do this. (laughs) I don't know about writing a book. Um, But it was, it was that moment of, you know what, we need to be heard. Yeah. And that, that thought of I really wanted to give us our voices back that became the drive for doing this you know when I started when you know in that moment it it didn't start about giving women of colors their voice back it just Mm. became about giving us our voices Mm. back um as I went along and as my public speaking grew again it's something else that it's like how is this happening Mm. (laughs) all because I dared to be open Mm. and be honest and you know you're saying it's about women unashamedly um telling their stories and I remember at the beginning of this I was so ashamed of my story that I thought you know what I can't write about being having two terminations you know Mm. one was bad enough but two come on I can't tell that part of my story and I really battled with that and I realized though that was actually the crux of why I couldn't grieve Mm. and if I didn't tell that story I wasn't being honest and if I wasn't being honest I couldn't fully own it Mm. so you know I did a lot of work around that and writing a letter to my younger self forgiving her Mm. for her past was part of that Mm. Um, and when I got into that place where I could hold my story for me Mm. it 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 became a little bit easier for me to (laughs) write it down (laughs) Yeah, a little bit easier for me to share it with people <laughs> but when people heard it outside of the community and accepted it mm. then I realized you know what this really does need to be heard mm. and for the other women it was a place where they could finally in a way it's not necessarily letting go I think it's letting out their stories 
because mm. it's one of when it's in your head and this is what happened you know this is what affects our mental well-being is when it's in our head when we're locked in that shame that grief that sadness that anger it can be quite destructive mm. but when we can just see it it loses that power of that hold on us yeah. and we can start to, in a way it was like giving birth and holding my baby my baby being my story mm. and being able to nurture her with love and care so that I could let the world see what she looked like and when I mm. found that I could do that I could keep I keep, could keep putting one foot forward and keep stepping forward in strength because I was able to embrace my younger self my inner child I was able to love her so you know what doesn't matter what you're going to do I love her mm. and I'm nurturing her and she, she grew from that and you know my book being my baby grew from all of that as well and the women's stories were all a part of that and it was so great to see them get excited about something they couldn't be excited about before yeah. and to own their stories too and they did it all in different ways but they did it mm. they stepped forward and it's like you know they gave me permission to tell their stories so I felt mm. like I had a nursery because I was looking <laughs> after their babies too and yeah and as I kept going and for my own I suppose being a black woman starting to learn about the disparities in the healthcare and starting to go back and see why my journey with the medical professions was so difficult you know mm. having fibroids myself being told they shouldn't affect me getting pregnant but then finding mm. out that black women suffer from fibroids at a higher rate mm. more painful and at an earlier age finding out that black women are diagnosed with endometriosis um twice sorry I always forget how to say the stats but um at a sorry they're 50% less likely to be diagnosed with endometriosis at an older age mm. and then at 48 I find out I had adenomyosis wow okay. which could have affected me getting pregnant and if I had known that sooner maybe something could have done about it looking at the fact that I had very heavy painful periods because of my fibroids because of my adenomyosis which even got worse when I became perimenopause but no one connected these dots it's like no one cared mm. but I'm thinking when I knew this hang on if I know this I'm seeing these stats I'm finding out this information why don't you know this mm. uh, and you're the doctor you know you're the consultant you know yeah. you should have been seeing me as oh, hang on a minute, Your, the stats are against you. I mm. need to look at this more urgently. At 43, no one, I had to lie to get fertility investigations wow. because they didn't see the urgency in doing it. Wait another year. I mean, our fertility plummets at, what, 34, 35? At 43, yeah. wait another year. Yeah. You know, it's, there's so much wrapped up in it. And, and, you know, around the pain as well, Black women are seen as having a higher tolerance to pain. So therefore we're going saying we're in pain it's not believed so mm. you know when I started to realize that and I started to interject that in in the talks I was doing mm. it really started opening up and giving black women that voice as well because our stories mm. our true stories our deep stories started to be heard through that narrative mm. Uh, that's so amazing I'm, I'm really glad that there's someone there fighting for for this um because it is something that you know a lot of people just don't think about is that disparity in the health services um so thank you so much for for doing that um I I'm mindful of time and I do have one more question um but before I get to that final question I'm wondering for anyone who's listening to this who this you know your story is resonating with them they're wondering how they might be able to find help how, is is this something that you help people with or, or is there somewhere you could point people towards in terms of being able to find out more about their stories yeah I mean I usually point people to gateway women or lighthouse women as it's called now yeah. that you know that is the community out there but I also also am aware that black women and Asian women go to the site and they see a lot of white faces and they say mm. actually there's no one there like me no one's going to understand so they don't necessarily join there are black and asian women in the community you know i host a women of color group in the community mm -hmm. as well so i also you know if people feel like you know and also some, sometimes it feels too big yeah um, because it's a lot of <laughs> a lot of voices a lot of people on there and depending again where people are on their grief 
depending on their personality type that mm. might feel a bit too much and overwhelming so you know I invite people if they want to reach out to me my blog is finding my plan b I'm on um Facebook as dreaming of a life unlived Instagram Yvonne J you know people can reach out to me on that level as well and I'm happy to talk to people on a one-on-one if they feel that that would be helpful in the first instance oh amazing thank you for that um we will make sure all of those links are included with the recording of this session as well so that people can just click um but uh you know as, as that final question um you know we've talked a lot about you know your journey some of the you know the stories that you've heard some of the things that you've experienced what would you say to those people in workplaces who may not realize that they're working with a woman who's struggling like this and what sort of things might they not realize could be triggering I think it's there's a lot here yeah <laughs> not, because it's one of those I mean if the hard thing is is if you don't know somebody doesn't have children mm. you're not going to know in the first you know you you will do mm. inadvertently do something that would be triggered mm. in the first place but I think the thing is 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 the realization of it and this it might take a bit longer than it does for some to realize there is a trigger there but it, I think the thing is is being sensitive to the fact that there probably is somebody in the workplace you know one in five women mm. are childless by circumstance mm. and I think that number set to rise to one in four because of the um, lack of access during the last two mm. years mm. so you know the chances are there are at least one woman that you're working with mm. uh, even a man actually because you know let's be inclusive there are men that do grieve the loss of mm. fatherhood but there are people, the chances are there is going to be someone in your workplace that is struggling with infertility, struggling to try and conceive or are living without children because they're at that stage when they know it's not going to happen. So it's mm. about having that sensitivity around mm. how you announce. You know, I've witnessed people just in, you know, in a virtual meeting, just go to everybody. Oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. And I thought, well, come on. <laughs> you know it's the just you know I know people are excited yeah and I, I don't want to take that away from them but you can go and tell people individually mm. yeah you know for one if you notice that somebody actually and that also the other part of the sensitivity is look around mm. you know try and realize that actually is there somebody that's pulling away is somebody going quiet mm. do not send the all scan mm. you know there's the baby scan photos do not go email all to them Mm. if you really feel that you're going to do that and anyone else listen don't do the reply all one because it's one thing that somebody's gone here everybody and I get it's easy to do a send all yeah you don't have to do a reply all no. <laughs> because it's the reply all that really adds to it because then you're hearing yeah. all the joy all the excitement and that is so hard, hard enough seeing the scan photo then it's really hard hearing all the comments mm. um when you have baby you know think about again how you make the announcement if you you know I was fortunate I've had times when people have pulled me aside separately say look Yvonne I'm pregnant I know what you're going through I just want to mm. let you know before I tell everyone else I loved that even mm. as a manager would because managers know beforehand yeah who's pregnant because people tell the manager or tend to tell the manager first um with the exception of their closer friends but then the manager probably knows the people who are childless because all people who are struggling with fertility. So they can ask, can I tell that person first so mm. that we can break the news so let them process it away from everyone else. It's all, you know, so yeah. many different things. Having virtual meetings, stop bouncing baby on your lap during a virtual meeting. <laughs> you know? And you can have a place for it because you can have... The meeting and then the last 10 minutes let's do the introduction so that whoever yeah. wants to leave can leave yeah um, or do it at the beginning so they come later it's all of those things think about the fact that there are some people who are going to find it incredibly painful may not want to be a part of it and just invite them to uh, be able to say no yeah let them have some control over the situation for themselves so that you know it's going to be painful anyway but they don't have to it, it 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 feels even harder when you're trying to hold it in publicly mm. feeling like you just want to run and scream but you can't let people go and run and scream before you do it all and then and then at least 
they can make a choice how how they want to kind of be mm. in the system with everybody else if they want to do it. But, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of things I probably haven't even covered in that, but it, you know, it gives you. A, I think that gives a sense of actually there are yeah. things that people can do that just shows a bit of care and sensitivity around. Yeah. The situation. Yeah, and and as you say, it's just that being mindful of those around you, regardless of what you're doing, whether it's about you know pregnancy and and baby loss, or whether it's about anything in your life. You know, there might well be people that will receive this differently. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, you don't know what somebody, you know, you don't know what phone call they had earlier in that day and what they brought into work on that day. You know, yeah. as well, there's going to be many other things outside of childlessness that that can impact mm. how someone receives some information so yeah awesome Yvonne is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we officially wrap up <laughs> oh do you know I for me it's that words of encouragement I know it's so tough and it can mm. feel very lonely and very isolating you know I would always encourage women to or men to reach out because mm. there are people who hear who understand who know what you're going through you don't have to do this on your own and there is life after the death of this dream Mm. there Mm. is hope you know hope is a form of denial and usually what the hope that people give us is about having baby keep trying it will happen Mm. but there is another form of hope there is the hope that our lives will be better can be better and it can be it's and if sound if it can be better sounds too hard to accept or to hear know that it can be different and Mm. both are fine you know we're not talking about getting rid of or letting go or putting away the grief and the that stuff around being a Mm. mum we're talking about just holding it together with alongside this different life that is okay for you to claim and walk into too yeah Awesome, Yvonne. Thank you so much for your time, your honesty, your openness. I really do appreciate it. And I'm sure our community will as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the invite. You know, you're so welcome. I'm so glad I've had the opportunity to speak to you today as well. Great.